morning of October 1st, 2019, as soldiers of the People's Liberation Army marched down to Tiananmen Square to celebrate the 70th anniversary of their motherland, the world caught its first official glimpse of the QBZ-191. China has never been keen on publishing details about its small arms online, and this time is no exception. This video will be an attempt to compile and present all available information about the QBZ-191 from both official and unofficial sources, with a heavy focus on the mechanical design of this rifle. Before we begin, I want to put out a few disclaimers. I do not speak a single word of Mandarin, so to avoid spreading misinformation, this video will mostly be analysis of available photos and videos. Any information derived from texts will mostly be from English sources, with a sprinkle of Google translated Chinese sources. I will link all sources in the description, and full credit goes to the original owners. With that in mind, let's begin. If you remember, I stated that the world caught its first official glimpse of the QBZ-191 in the 2019 military parade. Prior to this, some photos of the prototype have been leaked. This article by the Firearms Blog in 2017 is one of the first times the QBZ-191 was revealed on English internet, to my knowledge. Most notably, the article contained photos of two variants, a carbine, and a rifle. This is consistent with what we can see in more recent photos. I have seen some sources claim that these barrel lengths are 10.5 and 14.5 inches, but I have yet to find any primary sources confirming these numbers. Aside from the previous two variants, photos of a DMR with a long barrel and what looks like an M-lock handguard also exist. All three variants are chambered in a 5.8 by 42mm cartridge, which has been the standard small arms caliber for the PLA since the late 80s. The 5.8 used to come in two varieties. First is the 64 grain DBP-87 or DBP-95 for use in assault rifles. These are exactly the same, the 95 just burns cleaner and is non-corrosive. And second is the 77 grain DBP-88 for DMRs and light machine guns. In an emergency, these two variants can be used interchangeably, but not optimally. During the 2000s, the 71 grain DBB-10 universal cartridge was developed in conjunction with the improved QBZ-95-1 small arms family. This load can be used fine in machine guns, DMRs, and assault rifles. All versions of the 5.8 reportedly have a muzzle velocity of around 3000 fps or 914 meters per second. When the QBZ191 was introduced, so was another flavor of the 5.8 cartridge, designated DBP191. As far as I can tell, information about this load is unavailable at the moment. Also, let's briefly talk about the name QBZ191 itself. This designation was first spotted in this photo of a presentation, the context of which is unknown. It is unclear if it applies to both the rifle and the carbine variants, but the DMR variant is designated QBU191, according to this Google Translated Weapons Procurement paper. But for the sake of simplicity, in this video, QBZ191 will be used to refer to all three variants, unless I specify otherwise. Now, let's begin going over the design of these firearms, starting from the exterior. The QBZ-191 has an upper and a lower receiver, connected by two takedown pins. It is unknown whether these pins are captive, but this is likely, since the QBZ-95 has a captive pin. The QBZ-191 has an ambidextrous fire selector, placed right where the firing hand's thumbs would be. A notable detail is that the fire selector goes from safe, to full auto, to semi-auto with a 45 degree throw between each mode. Also, it's interesting that the full auto mode is marked with the number 2. As far as I know, the QBZ-191 does not have a 2 round burst mechanism, and this will become apparent when we look at the fire control group later. The QBZ-191 has a bulk release on the left side only, with a design very reminiscent of the AR-15. However, unlike the AR-15, the bulk release on the QBZ lacks the bottom paddle to assist in manually locking the bolt open. The charging handle on the 191 is on the right side only, and reciprocates in the gap between the upper and lower receiver when the gun is fired. The magazine catch is similar in design to that of the CMMG MK47, 
in that it has a paddle extended to the side, which can be pushed by the trigger finger. However, only the right side of the paddle is enlarged and striated, favoring a right-handed shooter. Both the rifle and the carbine sport the same polymer handguard, with permanent Picatinny rails at the 12 o'clock position, as well as provisions to mount additional Picatinny rails at 3, 6, and 9 o'clock. It should be noted that the folding front side assembly is not attached to the Picatinny rail, instead it is fixed to a metal sleeve mounted inside the front of the handguard. This sleeve is attached to the handguard by two screws on each side and one more screw on the bottom. My guess is that the metal sleeve is there to reinforce the front end of the polymer handguard from being crushed. If you take a close look at the metal sleeve in this photo, you can see that it looks like the sleeve is dovetailed into the gas block. If you look at this blurry CAD diagram, you can vaguely see the dovetail, which has a small notch at the back. This notch seems to line up with this pin on the metal sleeve, and if I show you this image of the other side, you'll see that this pin goes all the way through, and it's not the front side pin. I believe that this pin fixes the metal sleeve to the gas block, and thus the handguard is not free-floated. However, I think the non-free-floated design is intentional, since it secures the relatively flexible polymer handguard at both ends, the gas block and the upper receiver. This probably allows them to use a polymer handguard, which is quick and easy to produce, but still rigid enough that any laser mounted on it will probably retain zero, but that's just my guess. Speaking of free-floated handguards, that might be what is mounted on the QBU191 DMR. In these photos, you can see what looks eerily similar to AR-15 free-floated M-Lock handguards, and I wouldn't be surprised if they are actual M-Lock. If we zoom in closely, we can vaguely see that the front sight base might be directly milled into the handguard. Another detail is that the DMR seems to have a different muzzle device than the rifle and the carbine. The rear sight assembly on the 191 is foldable and has a very fine aperture. The design of this rear sight is very similar to the rear sight on the QBU-88, the previous generation of Chinese DMR. Both of these sights are foldable and uses a rotating disc with many different apertures at different distances from the center of the disc to adjust elevation. Note that there are two variants of the rear sight on the QBZ191. The earlier prototypes have the rear sights attached to the Picatinny rail on the upper, while the current guns have the rear sight fixed to the upper itself. Also, the prototype handguard has three vent slots and different screw placements. The prototype handguard is also slightly longer with 16 Picatinny slots instead of 15 on the current production. The final external feature we're going to look at is the stock, which is telescopic and not foldable. This CAD diagram shows the four positions of adjustment. It also shows why the stock is not foldable, because it's a receiver extension containing the recoil spring and the buffer. So far it looks like the QBZ191 has a lot of AR-15 DNA, with the fire selector, the bolt release, and now the receiver extension. The AR-15's influence will be even more obvious when we go into the internal operations of the QBZ191, which we're gonna do now. We come back to this diagram again, and here we can see what looks like an AR-15 stall bolt carrier group. However, there are some important differences. On the AR-15, the bolt carrier is cylindrical, and it nests inside the cylindrical upper receiver. But on the QBZ, it looks like the upper only covers the top half of the bolt carrier. Maybe there are internal rails, maybe the bottom of the bolt carrier is supported by the lower receiver. At this point, I can't find any information on this. Also, based on this diagram, we still cannot confirm the features of the bolt, but I do have some speculations. If we look at this photo of the left side of the gun, we can see what looks like two rivets. I'm thinking these rivets are used to mount a fixed steel ejector inside the aluminum alloy receiver, similar to a QBZ95. Now look at this slow motion footage of the 191. You can see that the case only starts to eject when the bolt is already pretty far backwards. Compare that to this slow motion footage of an AR-15. Because of a plunger ejector constantly pressing on the left side of the case head, the case ejects immediately as the case mouth clears the ejection port. Now look at the forward angle and the violence of the ejection pattern on the QBZ. With all of these considered, 
I think we can be fairly certain that the QBZ191 does have a fixed ejector, not a plunger ejector like an AR-15. Also, let's look at the slow motion footage again. We can see two notable details. First, when the bolt is unlocked on the 191, the uppermost locking lug is pointing straight up. Compare that to the AR-15, where there are no lugs pointing vertically when the bolt is unlocked. So maybe the bolt design is different on the QBZ191, or at least the number of locking lugs is different. Because if you just take an AR-15 bolt and shift it a few degrees so that there's one lug pointing straight up when the bolt is unlocked, then the bottom lug won't be in a good position to feed ammo from a double stack, double feed magazine. The other detail in this footage is the gas piston. You can see it in action right here. With that, we can confirm that the gas piston on the QBZ191 is 100% a short stroke gas piston. As for the gas block, we have this patent drawing here. The Google translated Chinese text seems to say that the gas block has a dual chamber design. The first chamber immediately connected to the gas board is an expansion chamber that reduces the pressure and temperature of the propellant gases. And I think they say that this is supposed to reduce gas port ablation? The gas regulator looks to be adjustable by inserting the neck of a cartridge into this hole here, very similar to the QBZ95-1. We can also see these two adjustment notches in addition to the one notch that is obscured by the regulator in this photo. I think it is likely that the gas regulator has the same settings as that of the QBZ95, being normal, adverse, and complete cutoff. And it seems like the dual chamber gas block design wasn't present in the early prototypes. If I overlay the drawing of the dual chamber gas block on the prototype, aligning the handguard pin with the notch on the gas block, you will see that it's not a match. But if I do the same with the current production gun, it fits perfectly. There's also this cat drawing. If I overlay it on the current production gun again, aligning the handguard pin with the notch on the gas block, it's not a match. However, if I take it to the prototype, it fits. Based on that, we can conclude that there were two gas blocks, with the dual chamber being the newer, improved design that is implemented in the final production version of the QBZ191. Now let's take a look at the final internal feature of the QBZ191, the fire control group. And well, would you look at that, that's an AR-15 trigger pack. AR-15 hammer, AR-15 auto sear, AR-15 disconnector. While the tail of the disconnector is a little different because the order of the firing modes in the QEZ is different, but still. And finally, a two-stage AR-15 trigger, where the sear and the trigger blade are two separate pieces. This piece, however, I have no idea what it does, and Google Translate couldn't help this time. Also, I mentioned before that the QBZ191 probably does not have a burst mechanism, and I came to that conclusion because I don't see any ratchets in the fire control group. Maybe there's a variant with a burst mechanism, but I haven't seen any info about it. And hey, even though I said it's an AR-15 trigger pack before, let's be fair to the Chinese because they did not just straight up copy it. If you look at the exterior of the rifle, you cannot see any pins from the fire control group. This, combined with what looks like a sheet metal housing here, led me to believe that the QBZ191 trigger pack is removable as one unit, very similar to that of the QBZ95. And on the 95, you can remove the trigger pack with zero tools. The presence of what looks like striations on this mysterious piece in the QBZ191 fire control group makes me think that you can remove it by hand as well. And even if that's not the case, the fact that it's one self-containing unit is already a commendable improvement over a mil spec AR-15 trigger pack. And thus concludes our analysis of the internal mechanism of the QBZ191. Now let's look into the accessories, starting with the most important of all, the magazine. There have been photos of two, maybe three variants of the 191 magazine so far, all of which are of a rock and lock design, of course, and have a capacity of 30 rounds, except for one variant. I'll begin with the most common variant, the one in the 2019 parade. We can see a small slot on the magazine. The slot is a round count window, present on both sides, 
that allows the shooter to see the round count but only when it's 5 or lower. I have seen plenty of comments saying that this is a knockoff PMAC, which I partially disagree with. I think it's undeniable that the exterior of the QBZ magazine looks almost identical to an AK PMAC. However, that's not the important part of a magazine. First, the locking surfaces on the QBZ magazines are unique. On the QBZ magazine, the mag release locks into two recesses on both sides of the spine, instead of the one lock on the spine like an AK magazine. Second, and most importantly, the QBZ is chambered in a proprietary cartridge. This means that they had to design the feed lips geometry from the ground up so that the magazine feeds reliably. And even above that, a different cartridge means a different weight that the magazine spring has to lift, different port pressures, different mold velocities, all of which must be calculated to have a properly functioning magazine. It doesn't matter if they slap square ribs or even dot matrices on the outside, it's not a PMAC, and real critical effort has gone into this thing. The second variant of the QBZ191 magazines is made out of translucent grey polymer. These magazines seem to be newer, and with these markings they look like they are a much better solution to managing round count than the previous variant. However, it seems like this magazine only has 25 rounds, which is pretty weird. The third variant, which I'm not even sure is a real variant or not, is made out of yellowish clear polymer. In all available photos of this magazine, they are loaded with dummy rounds and attached to the same rifle. If you compare this rifle with other photos of the QBZ191, you can see that this rifle lacks this handguard pin and the roll pins on the upper receiver. These details combined with the cheap looking finish makes me believe that it's only a training aid and the quote unquote third variant of the magazine is probably a training aid as well. One more noteworthy piece of info is that the QBZ191 is reverse compatible with QBZ95 and 95-1 magazines. This photo shows a 191 with a 95-1 magazine attached. Note the absence of the round count window. Also, I should mention that the 95 magazine lacks a bolt lock feature. Here you can see that the follower on the spine of the 95-1 magazine is exposed to engage the bolt catch, while the spine of the 95 magazine is enclosed. When the 95 magazine is used in the QBZ 95-1 or the QBZ 191, the rifle should feed just fine, but the bolt will not lock back after the last round. Another interesting accessory is the magazine coupler. It seems to be made from sheet metal and only allows for one mounting orientation. The next important accessory is probably the optical sight. Let's start with the standard infantry optic seen on the rifles in the 2019 parade. It looks like there are two variants of this sight. One is designated QMK152 with a hand tightened screw and a Picatinny mount for the QBZ191. The other is designated QMK171 with a QD lever and a proprietary mount that interfaces with the scope rails on the QBZ-95 rifle family. The scope itself is the same as far as I can tell. It is a fixed 3x magnified optic and has a bullet drop compensated reticle with stadiometric ranging capability, very similar to an ACOG. This photo kind of shows the eye relief of the optic which looks pretty comfortable. We can also see the yellow illuminated chevron this illumination is powered in daylight by a circular fiber optic light gathering unit above the scope. The brightness of the reticle seems to be adjustable with a rotating shield covering the fiber optic. It is unclear whether the reticle can be illuminated in low light using tritium, but no obvious battery compartment can be observed. The scope body of the QMK also closely resembles that of an ACOG, with an eyepiece housing mounted to the main body from the rear using four screws. The positions of the windage and elevation turrets are also similar, so I would assume that the internal mechanism is similar as well. Based on this assumption, I would look at the engineering drawings of the ACOG to see how the QMK works. Here we have the main body, the eyepiece housing, and the prism housing inside. We can see that the contact between these three elements is shaped kind of like a ball joint, which allows the prism housing to traverse lightly. This traverse is controlled by the elevation and windage turrets, which is how the scope is zeroed. And this is as far as I can explain the sight since I know next to nothing about optics. 
Yeah, and also there's a removable rubber eyepiece. There are at least three other optical sites that were spotted on the QBZ191, all of which I have almost no information on, except for a few photos. The first is this one, which may be thermal or light intensifying night vision. But since this image shows the scope being used in daylight with the front cover open, I'm leaning towards thermal. The second scope is spotted on this photo of an early QBU191 being tested. It looks like a very basic rifle scope with an elevation adjustment turret. The windage turret is probably on the other side. This thing that looks like a neural ring suggests that the magnification might be adjustable. Note that no battery compartment can be spotted. The last scope is spotted in more recent images of the DMR. These look like an improved version of the previous scope. Both the windage and elevation turrets can be seen, as well as what looks like a battery compartment and illumination adjustment knob for the reticle. The objective bell is more compact, and the possible magnification ring is much more pronounced. Another interesting detail is that the scope mount might be an integral part of the scope body. The next noteworthy accessory is a possible IR laser and illuminator combo, spotted in these screenshots from a promotional video for the PLA Navy. In these images, we can clearly see the illuminator, and while we can't confirm that the laser is there, based on the shape, it's highly likely. Next, we'll look at the vertical foregrips. This footage shows what seems to be multiple variants, but the most common version seems to be the one in the 2019 parade, with integral bipods and electronics. The front of this foregrip has a button with PTT printed on, which some people have speculated to be an abbreviation for push to talk. The rear has a power button on what looks like a battery cap, and a bunch of other mystery buttons. Also note that the bipod legs are solid in the 2019 parade, but in this newer photo, they are skeletonized. Aside from that previous foregrip, I can only find one more in real footage, which is this one. This also has integrated bipods, but the electronics seems to be gone. There are also these cat drawings of another foregrip, this time without the bipod. These two things are probably a light and a camera, and I'm guessing camera because these controls seem pretty complicated for just a light. The photo is too blurry for Google Translate, so if you know what these buttons say, please tell me. The last accessory we have here is a suppressor. There isn't much that I can say about it, other than that it looks like it has a quick detach mechanism. And that concludes my analysis of the new QBZ191 small arms family. I think we can all agree that it contains a lot of AR-15 DNA. However, I think the idea that this somehow means that the Chinese is incompetent is a little unfair. They are not a student that frantically copies their friend's homework 10 minutes before the deadline without understanding a single letter. We could see that their engineers had made real efforts to improve upon certain elements of the design, like the sheet metal trigger pack housing or the dual chamber gas block. Even the charging handle. If you look at similar side charging AR-15s, you will see that the charging handle must be removed before the bolt carrier group can be removed. Making the charging handle run between the gap in the upper and lower receiver was pretty unique, and it has no ingress points for dust and debris as well. You can argue that it's an answer to a question nobody asked, but it's a damn good answer nonetheless. Learning from others and implementing some solutions of your own is not a bad thing. After all, I don't see anyone talking smack about the Finns with their RK-62, the South Koreans with their K-1 and K-2, or most recently, the Japanese with their Type 20. Almost all modern service rifles are derivatives of either the AK, the AR-15, or the AR-18. I just think that Chinese small arms are really underappreciated. Rant over. Thank you for watching this video, I hope that it's been informative, and maybe even slightly entertaining. Bye-bye.